That was fantastic. Um, do we have questions for Salvatore? We, to the, um, if, all right, will you speak to the concerns that some people have expressed regarding um, libraries basically pulling out of the system and accessing the archive without paying into the um, offset system that CERN is overseeing? Unfortunately, I didn't hear the first part of the question because the uh, speaker here didn't work right. Okay, um, I'm the Scope 3 UNT, yes. and we have heard some concerns that um, institutions might pull out and not uh, pay, might just stop subscribing altogether uh -huh. and start accessing the information through the um, repository. Okay, I, uh, I heard uh, half of the question on both sides, so I think I get it. Uh, if you are the score three person at UNT, thank you. You are one of the tens of thousands of people who have taken the time to think about that, because if you have 2,000 libraries seen in every library, at least there are three, four, five people who have thought about that. So we have been touching tens of thousands of persons like you, so thank you. That's the first thing I want to say. The second thing I want to say is, yes, the way this works now is that CERN has signed uh, contracts with publishers which have committed us to pay $21 million over a period of three years to convert this journal to open access. That's one thing which is there and we can't change. On the other hand, what we have seen is that from a start where there were just a few libraries interested, we've gotten to over 200 in the US and to over 42 countries. This gives us confidence that people will not pull out and this gives us, gives us confidence that people will honor their pledges and their commitment to CERN, even though they are not financially and legally binding. I know it can sound insane. We must have good reasons to believe that we are on the good side of history, because so far, this actually has happened. And just in the last few months, since we signed the contracts with the publishers, to now, we have received at CERN millions of dollars more than we thought we would have collected up to this point in time. So yes, there is no risk for a library to pull out. You want to pull out? Pull out. Free ride. We will go back to square zero in three years from now, and uh, this will have failed. What the tens of thousands of persons like you who have supported us to, so far has taught us is that there does not seem to be an appetite for free riding. On the other hand, there seems to be an appetite for change and for finally having some global cooperation in the library and open access world to get something changed. So I'm not worried. Thank you. This again. Um, you were back on your three-legged stool you, uh, to uh, how this could be replicated in other areas besides high energy. Uh, um, how big do you think the importance of having the archive as a long-standing, um, already accepted um, part of um, a, a, as a repository was in developing this model? In other words, could this work in an area that doesn't have an archive in the, the decades of uh, storage uh, in, in an open access repository? I think this is an excellent question, and it's a question which has a different answer today in 2014 than it had when we started in 2006. In 2006 uh, and 2000, to 2010, when we were advocating this point, our main selling point uh, of the idea was, you see, you libraries are paying for nothing, because what people want is a service. You are buying content as a transvestite, as a, as a camouflage for paying for the service. Because back in 2008 and 2009, the appetite for reusing money for open access and smartly in the libraries wasn't there, because the options weren't there. What we have today in 2014, from PRJ to all possible kind of institutional arrangements, from open access funds to libraries who take the matter in their own hands and act as publishers, the world has changed. So the key point that we had to say, you see, you are using your money not 
not in an optimal way, you can do better. This awakening, not because of us, but this awakening has meanwhile happened. The point is slightly different then, which is the characterization of what you are exactly paying for. For scope three, and this is one of the legs, what we were paying for was just the stamp, because dissemination was something which was happening somewhere else in a discipline which does not already, or a context which just does not already have information readily available, what in reality you would be paying is not only a service of peer review and publishing, but is peer review, publishing, and dissemination. I guess it's more a matter of semantics in 2014 than it used to be. All right, one more. Um, can you tell us how the publishers um, are receiving this? I mean, it sounds like the money issue is happening pretty good. Um, so have you gotten feedback from the publishers about their feelings on the conversion? The, there is another stool here that I don't have, is that to get this work, uh, you need the three sites. You need the library site, in the scientific community, in the publishers, because a publisher can choose not to participate. At only one, I'm told, they did. So far, the, re the working relation that we have had with the publishers, I have to say, has been excellent. This is a real partnership, and, and I'll tell you why. Just think for a moment. We have, just in the Scope 3 system, about 2,000 libraries. We have six journals which use it to sell subscriptions, which now are in this operation. This makes six times 2,000 individual numbers, which is 12,000 individual subscriptions which, and contracts which have to be trimmed down, which means that you have to prepare note or credits for those who have already paid 2014. You have to amend the contracts for those who haven't. This is a titanic amount of work which you only consciously enter in if you want to give it a try. Obviously, this is a restricted, limited attempt where everybody has something to learn. I have to say that the response and the partnership that we have had with the publishing industry it's been excellent. Publisher could have chosen to come in at $10,000 per article. There would not have been any scope three. They could have chosen not to send a bid. There would not have been any scope three. He said everybody, it's a bit like your free rider question before. It looks like everybody's trying their best to see whether this can work as an alternative. There was a question behind you, I think. Um, in your slide, one of your slides, you showed that the American Physical Society had declined to participate. Um, I wonder if you anticipate that authors, researchers, will decline to publish in those journals since they are not participating in this process to make things open access. I run, uh, the American Physical Society uh, exited the process uh, almost at the end, uh, they declined to sign a contract. They didn't decline to participate. They participated and then they bailed out, to be precise with facts. Uh, we have to get to the end of the year and run numbers to see whether there is a, flexion, a, a decrease in submissions or not. From the numbers that I'm running for my job, I do see that in some particular areas which are very networked, that there has been a slight decrease in uh, submissions. That's one thing that is... Uh, Evident. There is also another fact that uh, we haven't yet, we started operation on the 1st of January and we still have to bring uh, some of the $21 million in, so we are focusing on something else. We have to focus at a certain moment to a concerted and clear outreach to the scientific community to say, hey, you have a mandate on your back. Uh, you have to do nothing. If you just publish in any of those journals, that's uh, automatically taken care for, for you. And once these things, they start, as you know, they spread, they snowball, maybe there can be a part of a, of a dynamics. Again, we just started, we have to wait three years, and then we have to do a real stable big number analysis. I do anticipate changes, because I am already seeing some changes on, uh, on smaller patterns. One change that I have seen is that actually one journal has published zero articles so far. And that's bizarre. It used to be the only gold open access journal in the field, was published about 10, 20 articles a year, now it's publishing zero. 
Might it be that it's publishing zero now because authors have understood that they can get exactly the same beautiful gold open access without paying anything if they go somewhere else and they still have this uh, journal a bit tainted by the fact that it was the one you had to pay? It's bizarre, but we already see some small changes. Thank you for the question. We have some publishers in the audience. I'm curious if they have any comments, observations, questions about the, the business model in, you know, embedded in scope three. Make perfect sense. I've got a question, Salvatore. Do, what is your feeling on um, the um, the price point? The you know, I think it was fourteen fifty, right? Yes. You know, do you think that will be stable? You know, what do you think is that going to go up um, long term, longer term, outside the current boundaries? I mean, what's? Uh, the, I guess it goes back to the sustainability question. This is a good one. The one thing which is important to say is that once we add a contract with the publishers, these contracts are fixed on a three year term. So we have baked in a given increase in the number of papers. We know how much we pay. $21 million is everything it costs. The libraries which are contributing to Scope 3 in the US are coming in at a zero sum game. So every library in the US is paying as much into Scope 3 as they use it to pay in subscriptions. So we are not asking anybody anything more. There is enough money in the system if nobody freeloads in order to get there. So that's a stable three-year scene. And this was at 1,500, 1,600. What is happening is that authors are starting to publish, maybe cyclic, but we see that authors are publishing in journals which are slightly cheaper. Since we have some journals which are in at 2,000, some journals which are in at 1,000. So it happens that the journals which are in at 1,000 are growing. The journals which are in at 2,000 are shrinking. So the nice effect is that our average APC is actually going down. Up, it cannot go because we have maximum that we pay. Now, what happens in two years' time? In two years' time, we have to repeat the entire process. These contracts, we do the contracts every three years because we want competition. Maybe some uh, new journals want to come in, maybe journals who left want to join, maybe we will expand to more disciplines, we don't know. There we have to have a total new tendering, and again, there is going to be a cap. The beauty of this is that in the arbitration between supply and demand, you remember the picture of the bazaar and the picture of the Apple, Apple store, what happens is that in the moment in which you are arbitrating, you are just fixing how much you are ready to pay, and then you go for tender. People are asking more, you are just not tendering the service out anymore, and you go back to the previous uh, system. So I do not anticipate this number to be able to go totally out of control, just because the system is a closed one where they can't. Final questions for Salvatore. Well, let, join me in thanking uh, Dr. Mele and his Thank you very accomplishment. Much. We will have a 15-minute break and then reconvene for the next session.